Okay. Thank you for having me. Um, I was a little worried when I saw the title of this conference, definite title, because it said New Developments in the Analysis of Monetary Policy. My paper in this presentation will have nothing to say about monetary policy or central banks. On the other hand, I was a little happier when I saw that it also said, and institutions, and it also mentioned Alex Zuckerman. And my paper is about an important institution, and that is inflation, and precisely how we measure, and one institution in which Alex has spent a lot of time at it, understanding, and that's also what I'm trying to do. I've also spent a lot of time trying to understand inflation in the context of monetary policy, and I've gradually become a little dissatisfied with simply the way we measure what we call by inflation. And this paper is the start of a longer research project in trying to understand precisely how we should measure inflation. And this is so much of a, this, and inf inflation, or inflation is of course just a change in the price index. Price index are such an important institution that I actually checked and you, if you open any random issue, say, of the American Account Review, typically more than 75% of papers use a price index somewhere. The price index are really, and measure inflation are pers pervasive across all economic discourse. They're used in many, many ways, but mostly I would label them under three headings. One, as either an objective or a target for monetary policy. Two, as a way to deflate nominal variables and thus obtain real quantities. And three, to measure the cost of living, and perhaps to index payments so as to keep a cost of living unchanged. This paper is strictly about the third of these aims, the third of these uses of price indexes. I, what I will do here is essentially try to measure the cost of living and build a price index that measures the cost of living. And the answer, the first answer to this question dates back more than a century ago, dates back to Las Paris and Pash. They said, well, to measure the cost of living, what you should do is pick up a fixed basket of goods and then ask the question, given a new set of prices, how much more income do I need to give you so that you can afford the same fixed basket of goods? Now economists, starting I think with Irving Fisher, but maybe even earlier, so again a century ago, criticized heavily this approach. For they argued, given a new set of prices, I would expect consumers to react by purchasing a different bundle. Keeping baskets fixed is really rejecting the law of demand, rejecting the core of economics. This has been called the substitution bias. You simply ignore the fact people substitute across goods as prices change. But it's really, keeping baskets fixed couldn't be more if you wanted more offensive to an economist, because people don't keep baskets fixed, they change as prices change. And so economists came up, after criticizing for 20 years, they finally came up with a good alternative to what the statisticians who were doing fixed baskets were doing. And that was in the work of the Russian economist Alfred Konis in, in the 1920s. And what he argued was, well, let's instead answer the following alternative question. Let us ask, given a new set of prices, how much more income do I need to give you such that you can attain not the same basket of goods, but rather you can attain the same utility level as you had under the old set of prices. And these will be known as fixed utility or economic cost of living in this. So if V is an indirect utility function and P of T is a vector of prices, then given a new vector of prices, PT plus one, oh, and AT is income or assets or wealth, given a new vector of prices, PT plus one, how much more income or wealth or assets do I need to give you? is the definition of the price index here called pi t plus one. And this is what we mean by inflation in the Kona sense. Now, to make this definition, and this definition of the cost of living, and I will use exactly the same definition, up, but you have to make it operational. And to make it operational, Konas did essentially use what was both the benchmark and also the frontier of economic theory at the time, and that was classical demand theory, where it is now covered in our chapter one of microeconomics textbooks. That is, you look at a consumer that maximizes static utility, subject to a budget constraint with perfect certainty. Since then, we've done a lot of work. We've learned how to handle changes in quality, how to, given that I don't know the utility function of the agents, perhaps I can approximate it through perhaps good approximation, how to use demand and price data to infer what the utility function of the agents is in order to back out the price index. So there's been a tremendous amount of work. Having said that, the framework is still the one used by Conus. We still today compute cost of living price indices the way Conus did 80 years ago. And this is where this paper will come in. Namely, I will move from, I will move from the static with perfect certainty model of consumer to what is much more natural, I'm sure, to everyone in this room who has done macroeconomics in the last 30 or even 50 years. And that is to think of consumers that instead of living in by one period with perfect certainty, rather live for many periods and face uncertainty in each of these periods. 
Okay, let's think about consumers that live in a dynamic stochastic environment. The result will be what I call a dynamic price index, or DPI for short. Okay, so it will still be a cost of linear price index, it will still be a Konus price index, but it will now be for a model of consumption for a consumer that lives in a dynamic stochastic environment. Why do this? First question, of course, of all papers, why? Why bother? Um, well, the first reason is simply because we can. Microeconomics textbooks have more than chapter one nowadays. Indeed, the chapter one of typical macro textbooks starts with a model of a consumer that lives for many periods and faces uncertainty. We know how to solve these models. Price index theory, for some reason that I don't quite understand, is still stuck in the 1920s. Why not bring it into the 2000s, into the 21st century? Second, in the same way that Second is just realizing that if prices change today, we would expect that a rational consumer responds by perhaps borrowing from the future in order to be able to afford more consumption today at the now higher prices. We'd expect consumers to engage in temporal substitution in response to changes in prices. A static approach, by ignoring the fact that consumer lives for many periods, will ignore this in temporal substitution and will therefore be subject to the same criticism that it raised. I will be subject to a substitution bias, now not a substitution across goods, but rather a substitution across time. Thirdly, and finally, because what's one of the main uses of inflation or price in this is, it's to compare different periods in time. If your model of the world in which you base your price index is a static model, that use is necessarily awkward and strange. In a dynamic framework, on the other hand, comparing the cost of living across different points in time follows, under, follows very, very naturally. So that's what I'll be doing in general. To make this a little more concrete, I'm going to apply it to a very particular question. And I guess with Alex retiring from teaching, this becomes also a question that he may start asking. And that is, consider that you're retiring today with some amount in your retirement account you'll live off until you die. You may ask, well, if instead I retire next year, how much more must my account have so that I'm different so as to when to retire, given that prices will have changed from last year to this year? That's a question that Alex may be asking. Hopefully his answer will be so much more that I'll keep on working forever. But it's an interesting question, and certainly a question that involves trillions of dollars of wealth in the US. We have huge amounts of retirement accounts, or even across the world. What should they be indexed to? Very related questions. How do you index disability payments? You want to compensate someone for being disabled? Well, you want to adjust that amount to, to account for the fact that prices may be different according to when you become disabled. How do you index that? In the realm of public policy or public finance, any fine, fee, or transfer from the government typically is indexed to something, what should you index it to? There's another question that I find particularly interesting. Again, in the conference in honor of Alex, then I'll, I'll raise also the question that maybe he cares about. He's a curious person, wanting to always use economics to understand the world. Here's a question. So Alex just told me that his children are 35, 30, and 20. So imagine that Alex decided today, well, I have accumulated some set of wealth during my life, and I want to bequest it to my children. So imagine I want to give some amount to my oldest child, who's 35 today, and I'll actually li leave part of my inheritance, part of my wealth, to my different children as they reach the age 35. You're 35, here's a stock of money, my child, go and be happy in the world. This is what I give to you. Well, there's of course the fact that one of his children is 35 now, the other one will be 35 five years from now, and the other one will be 35 15 years from now. How much more should you give to the younger, or less, relative to the older, given that he or she is now turning 35 at a later date, facing a different set of circumstances, namely prices. This is again a question that a dynamic price index that measures the cost of living can answer. Okay, so that's what I'll be trying to do. Outline very briefly, I'm going to define essentially just the economic environment and define the price index, and then we're going to go over essentially theory and data. What do I mean by data? I mean, I'm going to actually try to construct a DPI for the US. It's going to be a very rough first attempt, but I think it's already going to get, show you what are the main lessons you get from taking a dynamic perspective. Why, you know, what, why, what if I think, you know, I want to leave my child, I have two children, one with 10 years then I, want, I give one $10,000, and the other one I give 12. You know, I set, I set aside $10,000, then I look at inflation expectations for future periods, and, and I compute what, right. you know, what is the value of $10,000 in 10 years. What error do I do with it? Exactly. Well, you do no error if you use the right measure of inflation. And this paper will be exactly about what measure of inflation should you be using to compute that. And you will see how something like the CPI will not be the right answer. So it's exactly the calculation you said. It's, it's exactly about what measure of inflation should I be using for that calculation. OK, so what's the model? The model is going to be a relatively standard model of consumer behavior. 
And when I have agents that maximize expected discounted utility, where expectations are going to be rational, the scouting is going to be at the factor beta, which will reflect both impatience and the probability of death. And the period utility function is going to be Cobb Douglas and involves two sets of goods, non durables, labeled C, J, C sub J, and durables, which will be labeled S sub J. And there's going to be some set of ND non durables and some set of durables. It's going to be a fairly standard utility function. What are the budget constraints? The budget constraints is again very standard. The first line tells you that expenditure must be small or equal in wealth. What's expenditure is expenditure on non durables. P is a price vector with price of non durables. Yes? Can we take into account income uncertainty and lifetime uncertainty? I will get to that in one minute. Here's expenditure on non durables. Second component is expenditure on durables. R is a vector of prices of durables. Third component is your purchase of assets. B is going to be the purchase of whatever assets. Q is the price of those assets. The sum of all three uses of funds must be equal to the funds you have. Second constraint tells you how your wealth evolves. Your wealth tomorrow is going to be equal to the return on your assets. D is a vector of returns, dividends if you want it. Could be a set of prices, of course, as well. And second, the value of your durables, where delta, delta is simply a diagonal matrix with one minus the depreciation rate for each asset. So, that, so delta S is going to be the amount of the durable that you have remaining, and RT plus one is simply the val its market value, so that defines wealth. Third constraint says simply, well, wealth must be non negative, it's simply a no Ponzi game condition. Why? Because here I have no income. Why do I have no income? And here's your answer, because I'm thinking about an agent who retires. It's an agent who approaches retirement, how should I index my retirement account? So there's not going to be any income. Therefore, the constraint of no Ponzi games is simply that you can never go into negative wealth. Consumption of all assets is going to be, the consumption of all goods must be non-negative. And AT is the amount on your retirement account when you retire. And I'm thinking exactly the age that retires today and lives forever. The second part of your answer is what's uncertainty? So I have no income because I'm thinking about an age that retires. Why do I have... What about the uncertainty? Well, information in this economy and uncertainty, I'm going to focus on uncertainty solely on one thing, prices. So what are prices in this economy? is the price of non-durables P, the price of durables R, and the price of assets Q. They're going to be the only source of uncertainty. Now, I could have other sources of uncertainty, not income, but say, preferences technology. Okay? I'm not going to have that because that's not what a price index is supposed to be measuring. I could have that. Realistically, I would... I, I could easily incorporate that into the model. Then I would, of course, co construct a conditional price index the way we do it, meaning keeping the uncertainty on those fixes so that the price index only varies with prices. That's something that has been done in the literature many times. That's not where the innovation is here. So that's not what I'll be doing here. I'll be focusing only on prices so that my price index moves the price alone. Yes? I think with uh, taking into account lifetime uncertainty, since it's retirement, then annuity markets might play a role. Right, I have assets here, exactly. So I have assets. So if that will, you will say, so you would say that my B vector or my Q, my B vector of assets or my Q vector of their prices should include annuities and different forms of assets. For now, I'm leaving it. Could be a potentially very large vector. Yes. Yes. Okay. What's information going to be? Well, P. Upper T is going to be simply all the history of all the prices. I'm going to assume that the process are Markov, so set that's a sufficient statistic for all future uncertainty. Therefore, the solution to the problem is simply going to be, well, you maximize the consumption, you figure out an optimal set of actions. Given those actions, what's your utility? Well, it's going to be given by the value function or indirect utility function, which simply tells me, given the wealth that I have today and the price that I'm facing today, conditional on behaving optimally, how much am I getting? It's a very standard thing. That's the entire model. That's all I need, because all I need is a model of consumption to define a model of the price index, the cost of living. And therefore, I can jump immediately to define the DPI. And the DPI is going to be, this thing pi, is essentially the Kona's definition. Right? It's how much more in my retirement account AT must I have, given that prices have changed from yesterday to today. OK? So exactly like Kona's, what's different? The V function is now not an indirect utility function of a static consumer living uncertainty. It's instead of a consumer that lives for many periods, can buy non-durables, durables, assets, can trade over time, faces uncertainty on these prices. Okay? So that's the definition. What does this price index look like? What are its basic properties? <laughs> I'm going to get more time with all these questions. Yes? When you change the prices, 
competitivo de equipes atuando? Ou do you assume about the process of playing the competitive teams as well? Right, so I assume solely that, so far I assume solely that PT is a sufficient statistic for all those forecasts. Huh? So it could change entirely. And you'll see actually that, actually you've, you're anticipating a lot of some of the interesting new dynamics in this paper, which is precisely news are going to matter, not just the actual price change, but what a price change signifies for what's going to happen not just today, but in the future. So you'll see that soon. Okay, basic properties of DPI. Let me start with three very basic ones. First, going to be independent of wealth. Okay? And this just falls from the fact that I've assumed a homothetic utility function. It's very convenient so that, and this is standard in the price index literature, so that the price index for each person doesn't depend on the actual level of their wealth. Second property, again, sharing with conventional literature, M will be, say, the common component to every single price in this economy. And this says that the DPI is homogeneous degree one or moves on to one with an increase in all of the prices on the absolute price level. Okay? Third, when does the DPI coincide with the static index? Well, first case is, of course, that the agent only lives for one period. That's not the most interesting one. A second case that's interesting to keep as a benchmark is that up to first order approximation, if every single price follows a random walk, then the DPI is actually going to coincide with the static cost of living price index. Okay? And you'll see that also as I go through more properties. But at least that's useful. If you think, you can think, well, you can of course take a check of how could we have been so dumb? How could we be doing this cost of living price index for 80 years when clearly people live for many periods, ignore in fact live for many periods? Well, you can think that maybe you were taking as a first order rough approximation that prices as if they're a random walk. Okay? But well, the problem of course is that they're not. So, more interesting properties of the DPI. First, Familiar result on trends. Well, let me start. Well, I'm going to start. The way I'm going to do this is start with the very, very s simplify the model greatly, and then keep on expanding it. And as I expand it, I show you what new elements or ingredients or properties the model acquires. So let me start with a model in which there's actually no uncertainty, there's no durables, and there's no way of transferring assets across time aside from an annuity with a fixed price. Why do I start here? Because here the only dynamic element that I'm introducing is the fact that you care about v, i.e., the sum of utility, rather than period utility. That's the only modification in this slide. I'm going to keep on adding modifications towards the general model as I move across slides. Here, you start with some familiar results on trends. If the price of non-durable is increasing, the DPI is above one. Inflation is positive. The faster prices are rising, the faster inflation, the higher inflation is. Here already, though, you have a new result simply by considering the fact people live for many periods that you don't have in the static cost of living price index. And that is, if today you learn that prices are going to be higher tomorrow, well, that's going to affect your perspective on what your utility or your welfare, your cost of living is from today into the future. Therefore, if today you learn that someday in the future prices are higher, it is today when you learn it, when the news arrives, that your, your cost of living goes up. What if you then add intertemporal trade? Okay, so now let me add indeed assets and allow agents to trade. They're going to trade in bonds or equity. Okay? Then, and let's say that prices, the price, I'm still in the world with only non-durables, PJT is the price of each one. Let's say that they have a permanent component and an idiosyncratic component. Well, the first interesting property is that if the common shock is IID, the price index, a 1% increase in non-durable prices, raises the DPI or leads to inflation of 1 minus beta percent. Beta is a discount factor, and an annual, if this is an annual model, say beta will be 0 0.95. This is that a 1% increase in non durables prices. A 1% increase in the CPI, or in the static index, leads to only a 5 basis point increase in the DPI. What's the intuition? Intertemporal substitution. If price or ID, the agent responds. When the, in the static model, you assume that given higher prices today, the agent is going to have to simply consume 1% less. So he needs 1% more income given 1% higher prices. Here you realize that the agent responds to 1% higher prices today by borrowing from the future, by smoothing the shock over time. The stability to smooth means that he can, the effect of the price increase on him is much, much weaker, much, much smaller. Now, prices, of course, are not ID. In the data, if you wanted prices, the CPI is more or less something like an ARIMA 1-1. One -one. Okay? It's an AR1 in inflation, where eta is coefficient on inflation, the AR1 coefficient on inflation. What, it, what does the DPI look like then? Well, then a 1% increase in prices raises DPI by 1 over 1 minus beta eta. So, if beta is something like 0.95, eta is something like 0.9 as it is in the data, 
That means that a 1% increase in the CPI actually leads the DPI to increase by a factor of about 9. Okay. What's intuition? Well, look at the case where 8 is 0, price at a random walk. What happens then? Well, then there's no scope for sample substitution. Why? Because the shock to prices is permanent. Well, basic consumption theory. In response to a permanent shock, you don't need temporal substitute at all. What if the shock is more than permanent? A is positive. Well, then you realize that today, the higher prices, not only you cannot in temporal substitute against them, moreover, you should, well, to compensate them, moreover, you should in temporal substitute in the other direction. Because you know that your life is going to be much more expensive in the future, because prices are going to keep on rising. And so the impact on the price of cost of living is much higher. Final thing, across goods, What's the weight of different goods? As with the CPI, the, it's expenditure shares, which here are given by the preference parameters alpha. Now let's look at asset prices. The first important result, and this is immediate, but that doesn't make it less important. If the, price, if the cost of living, if your price index includes the relative price of bananas and apples, it must also, and I emphasize must, include the relative price of consumption today versus consumption tomorrow. So basic insight from by for already from Arrow. You want to index consumption not just by goods, but consumption also by the date or even the state at which it occurs. So as a, what is an asset price? It's the relative price of consumption today relative to tomorrow. Therefore, an asset price must enter any well-defined intertemporal cost of living price index. What is its impact? Well, again, start with the IID case. Well, here you see the one percent increase in asset prices leads to a beta percent increase in in, um, in the DPI. So you see that, for instance, if, all, if both asset price and consumer price are IID, asset price not only enter, they enter with a much, much higher, as high as 90 times higher, sorry, 9 times higher weight or 10 times higher weight than what the uh, CPI does. Okay? What's the relative impact of price of different assets? Let's say you consider, say, equity and bonds, E and B. Well, it's equal to their expenditure share. Okay? There's one important case here, though, that I have to emphasize. So after I've emphasized that asset prices must enter, let me then tell you when they do not enter, or even though they enter qualitatively, quantitatively they're not entering. And that's the case that I've already talked about when equity price follow a random walk, or returns are IID. That's why the DPI coincided with the static CPI. Why is that? Well, if equity prices are a random walk ID, that means that a higher equity price today means that no relative price from today into the future has changed. So no relative price of consumption today relative to tomorrow has changed, and therefore there's no impact on the DPI. Third set of results is with regards to the third set of prices. Those are durable goods prices. Here it's important to realize that there's an important quantity when you think about durables and consumption. That is the user cost of the durable. What's the user cost? Well, the, the cost of using a durable is equal to its price today minus how much I can sell the remainder of it tomorrow, delta is the depreciation rate, RT plus 1 is the price tomorrow, divided by IMT plus 1 would be the return on financial assets, and that involves essentially the opportunity cost of holding your wealth as a durable instead of a financial asset. Okay? Well, you can show that the impact, what's the relative marginal impact of a 1% increase in a durable price relative to a non-durable? First, set up alpha J over alpha I, this is for the durable J, is just the expenditure shares that we had before. The second term is also what we had before. It simply says that the more persistent is the shock, the higher its impact on the DPI. And we already had this 1 minus beta eta before. It's the equivalent here. So what's the difference between a durable and a non-durable? This third term. What does the third term say? It says that the proportional increase that the, in, that the price of the asset has on the user cost has affects its, way, its impact on the DPI. This is best seen in the case say, of IID again. Why? In, I, in the case where the price of durable is IID, the term in this parenthesis is equal to simply 1 over the depreciation rate. Okay? Well, 1 over the depreciation rate, the depreciation rate, if we're talking about a durable like housing, which depreciates, say, by 1 or 2% a year, this says that a 1% increase in the price of a durable leads to 50 to 100 times higher increase in the DPI than that of a non-durable. Why? What's the intuition? What's special about durables? Again, something special about the DPI is that durables and non-durables are different things. And why are durables different? Well, they're different because the one durables, if you want, it serve two purposes. They're both a good, but they also serve as a form to transfer wealth, assets. What happens if their ID and their price increases? That means that not only is it more expensive for you to buy your house, also you foresee that by buying it, you'll be incurring a capital loss tomorrow because its price is expected to fall tomorrow. Therefore, the cost of owning the house is now much, much higher. It comes both with a higher cost 
of reaching the utility it gives you, but also with an expected capital loss. And that's why durables can have a much larger weight. To conclude, therefore, from the theory, DPI is high if prices trend up, higher the steeper the trend, and very important, it's forward-looking. Relative to goods prices, it's very important to encounter temporal substitution. Moreover, once you consider temporal substitution, you realize that the more persistent is the shock to prices, then the larger should be their impact. Further, asset prices enter the DPI, and perhaps even a lot. Fourth, that shocks to durable prices have an extra impact due to changes in user costs and expected capital gains or losses. Moreover, the more durable is the good, the larger the weight it gets in the DPI. Okay? So that's what I learned from the theory. How much time do I have now? Seven minutes. Excellent. So now let me move to the data. Okay? So that's... that's <laughs> now I get eight minutes. Yeah? So this, uh, <laughs> I'm going to mention this eta parameter, the coefficient in the auto recurrence. Right, just for that example. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be at the individual good level? Yes. So you're assuming that all goods have the same flow? The same no, I haven't assumed anything. Here I've been trying to illustrate the lesson. Right. So there I said, so to illustrate that, I said, imagine that all prices have a common idiosyncratic component and say that the common component has an eta. So say if it's a stochastic trend common to all of the things and it has an eta. That's something that monetary policy controls and then you know. Perhaps. That's, yeah. Then this is a paper about monetary It could be. I'm not claiming that, but it could be. I, yeah. Uh, you started with the logarithmic utility function. Yes. How about starting the results to extend? So, well, they are and they are not, meaning. Well, there's two issues. One is, what if I, instead of having constant expenditure shares, I had expenditure shares that vary over time? Okay? From what I know from the static CPI theory, it doesn't make a, make a very big difference. Okay? If I do the CPI or I do instead, which essentially assumes those preferences, where I keep expenditure shares fixed, or if I adjust them over time, it doesn't make a huge difference, relative at least to the huge difference that I've been talking so far. There's a second assumption there, which is the, re the coefficient of interpolation elastic substitution is one. Okay? So one is the across goods, the other one is across time. That matters because interpolation substitution matters. Okay? How much does it matter? I give some calculations in the paper. Insofar as example substitution is smaller than one, then I show that the effects, the, if you wanted the multipliers, the marginal impacts of shocks, w I will be overestimating them by somewhere between 10 and 20%. So that's how it matters. OK, data. So I'm going to be looking at essentially the CPI. Well, I'm CPI, sorry. I'm going to be trying to build a DPI for the US. I'm going to consider some broad categories of goods. For non durables I'm going to pick up the four main categories in the CPI. And they are food, energy services, and others. I'm going to get the price and expenditures from the BLS. For durables, I'm going to consider the other two, house and durables. So across my six goods, I actually have 100% coverage of what's in the CPI for the US. For other prices, I'm going to get from the BLS. House prices, actually, the BLS is terrible, the price index they have there for houses. So I'm going to use something else, Freddie Mac. Paces and depreciation rates are going to be set to match, are going to be calibrated to match the expenditure shares that I get from the consumer expenditure services and from the survey of consumer finances of wealth and tangible wealth to financial assets and in real estate wealth to others. Okay? That's how I'm going to pick my parameters. The only interesting thing to note is that whereas how Housing is much more durable than other durables. It's not surprising. Okay? Asset prices, I'm going to be considering two assets here. So no annuities, I'm sorry. But for my empirical application, I'm going to be considering two assets. Equity and bonds. Okay? I'm going to get the portfolio equity shares to match those in the survey of consumer finances. Finally, information. Last element, forecasting, expectations. Here is where certainly a lot more improvement could do, though. It requires way, a lot more data than the one I have access to. Which is, I need to say how does a one, I already know that persistence matters, especially how a 1% increase in prices affects my expectation of what prices in the future are going to do. What I'm going to do, well, I'm going to pick, I have eight prices between the two assets and the six goods. I'm going to simply fit a VAR, a good one. I've tried many different type of VAR type models. They all give me the same result. The particular one I'm going to show you is simply a VAR of two on first differences, or the first difference of variables. Like I said, I've tried many, many specifications, which I've not, I'll not cover here. So here it is. All this work, and here's the DPI. I've plotted also the CPI and bond returns, just for a comparison. DPI is in blue. It's very different. Correlation with the CPI is zero, minus 0 0.02. Okay. That's interesting to know. Why is, why is it different? Well, here it's a little jagged. Well, you can see it's very volatile. Here it's simply, the, instead of the annual change, it's a decade change. 
So say, for instance, here the value of 2000, this will be inflation between 1990 and 2000. Okay, so this decade makes it a little clearer. Here you see the DPI and CPI. Here, what's the correlation? It goes up all the way to 0.6 or 7. Okay? So the DPI and the CPI share the same trends, but not quite. Okay? One, they change a lot year to year. Why? Sorry, going back to this figure, because the DPI is a lot more volatile, and especially it's much more serially uncorrelated than the CPI. The serial correlation of the CPI is 0.94, then at the DPI, well, it's 0.2 or, th or 0.3, I don't remember. Okay? They share the same long-run trends, though even here with some exceptions. From 2000 onwards, average CPI inflation has been about 2%, slightly over 2%. Average DPI inflation has been about 7%. Okay? So even in the, the particular episodes where they've differed a lot, the 2000s onward. And now let's understand why this is going on. Let me tell you why is this the case. Okay? Let me try to do it with a simple table. First has the, the first row has the volatility of the different prices. And here just to show you that, look, I'm including equity. Equity is very volatile. See how much, it's much more volatile equity price or returns. It shouldn't be a shock than any other price. Maybe by including equity, that's the reason for all this volatility. Okay? That would be your first impression from there. Well, not quite. Why? And that the second row asks that question. Imagine that all prices follow a random walk, which by the way, for equity, is a very close approximation. Then equity prices have an impact of zero in the DPI. So the second row is the random walk impact, just to show you the expense. Essentially, those are the expenditure shares from the BLS. Equity has a zero impact. So no, it's not the volatility of equity that's making a big difference. The third column gets much closer to the truth, the third row, I'm sorry, and shows you the persistence calculated simply as what would be the AR1 coefficient on each individual goods price. This just to show you that energy price, for instance, which are also very volatile, or equity, well, equity is essentially a random walk, to that what are very persistent prices, bonds prices, and house and services. That, as we saw, has a massive impact on the impact of these shocks on the DPI. Okay? The next row is precisely then the AR1 impact. Imagine that each price follows an independent AR1. What's the impact then of a 1% increase in that price on the DPI? What do you see? Well, what are the big drives of the DPI? Housing and bonds. Okay? Why housing? You've asked this question. Because it's a very durable good. And we saw that that puts a big multiplier on that price. Why bonds? Because they're an asset price and they matter a lot. And unlike equity, returns on bonds are highly, highly persistent. Last row actually has the impact on the VAR that I showed you. Why do I? So we've already we already see what drives the PI. It's equity and uh, sorry, it's bonds and housing. Why is it that it's so volatile? Well, because some all of, some all of the elements in this row, you get a number like six. I hear one percent increase in all prices. Independent is going to lead to a more than one. It's going to lead to something like a six percent increase in DPI. Why? Because all prices are very persistent. All prices are AR ones in first differences to a first approximation. So conclusion from the data: Why is the DPI so volatile? Because shocks are persistent. If you see higher prices today, you should be really upset. Why? Because not only are they high today, you know they're going to be higher for the future. Why are there sharp movements? Actually, and I've played a lot with this. It has to do with the equity prices, those jerkings up and down. But their actual impact is very small in terms of the trends in the DPI. More importantly, what drives the DPI? Two things. To a first approximation, there are two things that drive DPI. Housing and bonds. Why housing? Because it's durable. Something that a static index would always miss. It misses the fact that housing is durable and therefore matters way more than just simple non-durable. Second thing, bonds. Why? Because it's an asset price, something that people are usually transfer well, and their returns are very serially persistent. Okay? So, to conclude, I have a couple of minutes, or? No, but how many minutes? Because then I could do something else instead of just conclude. No, then I'll just conclude. OK, to conclude, what did I do here? I tried to study the optimal price index for a retirement account. It's a big question. There's about a trillion dollars just in private pension funds in the US. If, if President Bush goes ahead with this plan for turning the social security system into a private accounts plan, this number is going to increase by a factor of many. So there's a lot of money involved in this. I theoretically show that it is just four of the main things that I think I learned. It's forward looking, that intertemporal substitution and shock resistance matters, that asset prices enter, and that durables are special. They're not just like an undurable. When I apply this to the data, what did I learn? That A, it's very different from the CPI. 
Very different. And two, that, why is it different? It's mostly driven by house prices and bonds. House prices are in the CPI, but are very underweighted. Bonds are completely ignored by the CPI. Last thing I want to say, though, is the following. A lot of these things may seem strange. Huh? I showed you a price in this. It looks very different from what you're used to seeing. And so many of you may be reacting as everyone reacts to something new by shaking their head and saying, mm, this is just very weird and very different from what I'm used to seeing. So I don't want you to leave with that reaction, so let me say something to address that. In 1978, Bob Hall wrote this very seminal paper on consumption with rational expectations, meaning let's write consumption theory following on the cue, of course, of Milton Friedman and Franco Modigliani. Let's think about consumption for an agent that lives in a dynamic stochastic environment, that lives for many periods in face uncertainty. When he got his result, when he wrote this paper, his results looked extremely weird. He said, look, consumption doesn't change with changes in income. It moves with news about income, not with changes. He found that the persistence of the shocks to income makes a huge difference for, say, the persistence of consumption, or even just the reaction to the shock. He found that asset prices entered consumption choices. Indeed, it was the interest rate, the sole determinant of consumption growth. He found that durability mattered a lot, and Mankiw especially later showed that durables and undurables behave very different in the life cycle permanent income hypothesis. And he found that the volatility, and this is the excess smoothness puzzle that came later, that if anything consumption was too smooth, the theory predicted that it would be a lot more volatile than where we saw in the data. Huh? At the time, I heard that when Bob Hall first presented this at MIT, someone in the audience turned to him and said, you must be on drugs. This just doesn't look at all like the consumption function though here. Okay. <laughs> so, that's what he did in consumption. What am I doing in price index theory? It's really just bringing Hall 1978 to price index theory. It's again putting in a price index theory. Likewise, you're going to get exactly the same weird results. News matters, persistence matters, you get volatility, asset prices enter, durability matters. Okay? So it may sound weird to you on first impact. Well, that's because you're too used to thinking about price index the way you've seen them. Think instead of the good macro theory you've seen. If you think of in terms of good macro theory you've seen, it shouldn't sound weird at all. It should sound extremely natural. Things to do, well, I'm going to skip things to do. There are many things that could be done. That's it.